verse 8. The second angel followed, saying, It has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen, who made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. Knowing what we know about this, what is being called sexual immorality here? Yep, exactly. So then we have to figure out who or what is being called Babylon here, right? The Greek form of Babel, Semitic form Babylu, meaning the gate of God, in the Assyrian tablets it means the city of the dispersion of the tribes. Okay, and I'm reading from the Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Um, and it talks a little bit about what Babylon was geographically and historically. But what I want to focus on for us comes from Vine's Dictionary of the Bible. The word drink here. It has fallen, Babylon the Great has fallen, who made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality. According to Vine's Dictionary of the Bible, the word drink here is the word potizo, which is used here figuratively with reference to teaching. Okay? It's the same way that Paul uses this word in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says, I fed you with milk of spiritual watering by the teaching of the Word of God, right? It is the same word for being provided and being satisfied by the power and blessing of the Spirit. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 12. And it speaks to partaking. So you have feeding, being satisfied, being provided for you, and you have partaking. All of those words, this word carries that connotation. And so Babylon the Great, has fed, has caused the nations to partake, has provided for, has satisfied the nations of the world with, as Vine says, paganism with details of the Christian faith. In other words, there's just enough truth mixed in to the lie to cause people to partake and to perish whether it is as a Muslim friend of mine um, or Muslim acquaintance of mine. At one point I thought he was a friend. This was years ago. He's an acquaintance. He said this week that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are all the same because they all worship the same God, which is the common mantra that is being recited because they make claims to monotheism and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But any side-by-side -side comparison of Allah and Yahweh are very clearly disparate. They don't have the same personality. They don't have the same attributes. They don't act the same way. They don't say the same things. Right? But there's just enough presentation to confuse. A sister asked me this week about Seventh-day Adventism because she had had a meeting with a Seventh-day Adventist sister and just had some questions about the finer points of some of the doctrinal positions. Then she asked me, were Seventh-day Adventism and Mormonism similar? And I had to take her through the facts that Mormonism, while it claims to be Christianity, and we all know this, clearly is not, because the Elohim of Mormonism used to be a man. Whereas Yahweh has no beginning. And let's just start there. And then a whole plethora of things develop which point to huge doctrinal and positional errors in Mormonism, which makes it clear this is not Christianity. And yet, it has some things which are appealing, right? Some major so-called pastor this week is having Glenn Beck at his church to preach this week. 
I can't remember who it is, but it's some major evangelical, but he's having Glenn Beck at his church to preach this week. I'm like, we haven't figured this out yet. But there are things that are close enough. You know, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the, the song from Mary Poppins, right? A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. All it takes is just a little bit of truth to make the lie palatable enough for you to swallow. And this is why we have to know what saith the Lord. So that we are not drinking the wine of Babylon's immorality, which brings the wrath of God. Let's look at Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. It's on the next slide. So if one of your brothers would pick that up, that would be appreciated. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, If they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speak. So from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Keep going, Steve. Second Kings 20, 16 to 18. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of Jehovah. Behold the day come, that all that is in thy house, at which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, save and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, whom thou shalt get, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Babylon, powerful, clearly, because the Lord says, there's nothing, if these people set their minds to it, that they can't accomplish. And yet it's prideful. Come, let's make a name for ourselves sinful because it is seeking to replace God. Destructive. Because in causing people to look away from God, right? What happens as a result? Confusion. And then later we see Babylon used for destruction in the same way that we talked about earlier in terms of taking one's legacy away, taking one's strength away. If your sons are going to be carried away and be eunuchs. And what's interesting here is how verse 18 is worded. That word issue is the same Hebrew word that's describing ejaculation. Okay? When I think it's Ezekiel that talks about how um, Israel and Judah have perverted themselves with lovers whose issue is as powerful as stallions and whose members are the size of horses, right? So that word that's being used there, your sons shall issue from you. In other words, out of your loins, it's a, it's a very sexual term, your sons shall come and you'll beget them, but they will be taken away and they will be made eunuchs. In those days, when you were made a eunuch, it does not mean that you just were not allowed to have sex. It means that your testicles were removed. Mm -hmm. yep. 
So look at the paradox. You stay with God and you have seed, which reproduces. You step away from God and that which you produce will have no further generations. That's the worst thing you could say to a Jewish man. Oh, apropos for today. Indeed. Indeed. And ultimately, that which cannot reproduce is destroyed. Right? It cannot further itself. Verse 9 to 12. The third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. Now, right before that, we had the wine of sexual immorality. And now, the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image or anyone who receives the mark of his name. This demands the perseverance of the saints, who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. So I got to thinking, what cup is this? And the Holy Spirit took me to Matthew chapter 26. And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup of God's anger, which is filled with the wine of God's wrath, is the cup that Jesus is speaking about. And because he drank from that cup, we can drink from the other cup that is mentioned in Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. We do not have to drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength into the cup of his anger, because Jesus did that for us. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. That is our cup. For this is my blood. And that's what busted my face today. Mm. Yeah. The son of God's soul swallowed up in his arm. Yes, sir. And people still ask me why. Well, anyway, thank you yeah. for that. Amen. 
Next slide. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their labors, for their works follow them. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and there was one <clears throat> like the Son of Man, seated on the cloud with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the sanctuary, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come, since the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's interesting that when Jesus is walking the earth, He's telling his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he's talking about the people who would hear the gospel and come. But this isn't that. This is another harvest altogether. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel who had also a sharp sickle came out of the sanctuary in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar and called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vineyard. Because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle toward the earth and gathered the grapes from the earth's vineyard and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. Have mercy. Then the press was trampled outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press up to the horses' bridles for about 180 miles. The, the imagery here is, is just, I mean, first of all, you know that a horse's bridle is about five and a half feet up, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, just an image here, because we're talking about, again, symbols. 180 miles, a lake of blood that is 180 miles around, and five feet deep, five and a half feet deep. I can't even. But let's examine this. Okay, let's look at verse 13. Right, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their labors, for their works follow them. G.K. Beale says, now an exhortation is given to true saints to persevere through temporary suffering. And he's talking about verse 11. <clears throat> through temporary suffering inflicted on them because of their loyalty to Christ so that they might avoid the eternal consequences of loyalty to the beast. I thought that was a, a good parallel. Temporary suffering. If you're loyal to Christ, there is temporary suffering. If you're loyal to the beast, there are eternal consequences. There is eternal consequence for those who follow the beast. There is eternal reward. Okay? If believers persevere, even in the face of death, they will be blessed. This includes believers who die a martyr's death or from natural causes. The emphasis is on those dying in the Lord, not on the precise manner of death. Like martyrs, those dying from other causes will also receive the blessing because they likewise, in their own ways, are resisting the pressures to conform to idolatry. And that goes right in line with what we were saying before. Either the first beast of persecution will attack you, or the second beast right, of deception will attack you. And in either case, you have to stand firm. You have to be able to resist. Notice how Revelation 14, 14 to 19 is parallel to this passage in Joel. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's Joel 3, 12 to 14. 
Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. Swing the sickle, because the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes, because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow, because the wickedness of the nations is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So this is imagery that John has, which is very much biblical, very much Old Testament, and his early readers would have or should have identified that that's imagery from the prophet Joel. The gathering, the sickle, the harvesting, the wine press the trampling down of the wicked because God is now sitting in judgment. And you know that he's talking about people because notice one second they're called grapes, but in another, what comes out of the wine press is not juice, it is blood.